Welcome back. I'm Dr. Andrew Duggleby, CTO and co-founder of Venus Aerospace. So in the last episode, we were going through kind of the Venus overview, starting off with jet engines versus rocket engines and hypersonics, RDREs, and then RVS plant. So this is the deep dive into jets versus rockets, but really just this episode is going to be enough just to go on jet engines itself and dig into what's that technology. So as a reminder, we talked about the fire triangle, all combustion is the fire triangle where they have a fuel and oxidizer and a heat source. And it's the process of taking that fuel, turning it into heat with reacting with oxygen or any other oxidizer you want to carry. If you're a rocket engine, that is, uh, using air if you're a jet engine, and then turning it into thrust. So that's that conversion from sort of heat energy into thrust kinetic energy. And we mentioned, you know, the thermodynamic version of that, which is suck, squeeze, bang, blow. So sucking, drawing in the air, squeezing, compressing it, bang, you know, mixing and, and adding heat to it below and then you know sending the heat back out and ultimately that we're talking about you make thrust by having different speeds so I, I have the diagrams below i've got the jet engine here and i've got the ramjet and really we're talking about from a high speed flight point of view we're all trying to get to ramjet that's usually the way you can look at it somewhere between that mach 4 mach 5 you can get into a ram start and if you're using a jet engine to try and get up to that ram start condition you have a couple of challenges. So you have your drag curve here. And so drag actually spikes towards Mach 1. And then your jet engine, this is roughly the thrust profile. And so you have a pinch where it's barely, or you know, it's your least amount of acceleration close to the sound barrier or close to the maximum drag. And then you have this gap, right? If you don't design your turbine just right, you may not be able to get to ram start where you, uh, if you've watched uh, Tom Cruise and Top Gun Maverick, with the door swing shut and that kind of stuff. So this is a challenge for turbine-based combined cycles. And then we talked about it from a point of view of heat, that air is not ultimately free, and that you have some drag, so from drag, friction drag associated with that air, and that has to be radiated away. And so there's some temperature, as the temperature curves are going up along some dynamic pressure that you might be flying at. So this might be 400 pounds per square foot, this might be 1,000 pounds per square foot, and so you can see just if you're flying lower at a lower altitude, that, that speed temperature of your vehicle is a lot higher. So to kind of go further now into jet engines, really it's, it's about like, well, how does this thrust curve come from? What are the same, you know, kind of the major players uh, in jet engine technology? And what I really want to start off with is actually, you, you have these compressor blades here again, the combustion chamber turbine blades. I'm going to get into just a super high level of sort of rotating machinery, turbine machinery, you know, for version one. And I'm going to draw it just kind of simply like this. So if I have a row of blades, right? I have a row of blades. And I'm trying to have all these at the right angle. And if you have air, I'll do air in blue. So that air is coming down in blue like this. Now on this, this vector, I'm actually going to draw something very particular. And that this row of blades are actually rotating. So this whole thing... All of these are rotating, because this is my this is my rotator blade, this is the compressor blades over here, at some omega r times the radius, whatever radius is, and this is your rotation rate. Okay? And because of that rotation rate, I'm gonna, actually I'll keep this in green to keep it for similar. This is, you know, kind of that speed. And so the resultant, what this blade actually sees, because this blade is moving, it doesn't see air coming straight at it. Because it's moving, it sees air coming at an angle. And so that's the resulting angle. And so that is the flow angle that's actually hitting this blade. Right? Now, this blade is going to have kind of some angle with respect to the air. It might have an angle of attack. You can think about it. And some of these are curved intentionally. That's usually what compressor blades are doing. And so it's actually going to turn that flow like that. So in the course of this process, going over the blade, it's going to turn that flow. Now, as it's doing that, just like regular aircraft wing, this, this whole thing is going to generate lift. And so each one of these blades is going to generate a lift. And opposing that lift, because this, this compressor system is at a, at a constant speed. So not true when it's spooling up, but at its rate, that lift is opposed by the torque. And, you know, torque of the system. Torque, you know, torque divided by the radius. That, that torque you're putting into the system to combat that lift. So it's, it's, it's actually doing work on the air. 
and so this the system is not speeding up. And, and we'll come back to what's the effect of the rotation rate. And so um, the act of this is actually turning the flow, and then usually what you'll end up having, right? So if I keep my color system consistent, then my flow has now been turned. So the actual air, if I was just standing looking at the engine, I would see these blades buzzing by, and the flow has now been turned because the blades pushed them. Right? Um, here again is that standard green curve. Look at that. And then, you know, the blue velocity vector. You know, what, what does it look like from these blades? It kind of, so trying to get that line where it looks like it's kind of parallel to that line as it's going by. And so, it's, it's got, you know, it's turned the flow, and so a lot of times you will have these systems then go over a stator. So it'll be a com kind of a row of compressors and a row of fixed stators. So I'm going to kind of draw a couple stators below here. Normally they're pretty close, I'll just kind of draw them below. And so you'd have these stators kind of turning back the flow. And so the flow would kind of go straight again. And maybe you have another round of blades. So kind of compressor, stator, compressor, stator. And that's, this picture over here is actually showing five rounds of compressor. In fact, this is great because you can see the, the compressor blades are the ones attached to the rotor that's spinning. And then this right here is a stator. It's fixed to the, the outer casing of the engine. So great, great diagram. And so this is this is the root behind, you know, we're putting work into the system to compress it. So sex squeeze bang low, right? Uh, and the reason we're doing that is you, you have to get to a higher pressure to then do your combustion to extract. It's, it's through pressure loss, right? Going from high pressure to low pressure. It's, through, it's that work term, you know, and, and I may go a little bit deeper on some other episode into the thermodynamics, but I think this is enough for now, just as long as you understand that it's through pressure, like go from high pressure to low pressure, that's how you actually are extracting work. And the work can come um, both from you actually, you know, pushing the air faster out the back, as well as, you know, boy, where are you getting the energy to do this compression? Well, the energy to do this compression is coming from the turbine blades right here. And so you're actually extracting a little bit of the flow. And when I say a little bit, like, let me be clear, a little bit can be, say, 30 to 40% of the energy of that combustion could be going towards driving the compressor blades, right? That's a, that's a big number. That's a big number. So um, could you do this with an electric battery I, for a few minutes? Sure. But this is, this is a lot of power. That's a lot of power to have to kind of keep driving forever. So you'd, you'd have to somehow recover it. And so if you're going to do it with an electric battery, then you got to figure out, well, is my turbine then driving a generator? Now I have losses to driving the generator to, to then drive the battery to come back and drive the current. So you know, usually that's why these systems, you can see it here, linked in this hub. And some of the more advanced jet engines have multiple of these hubs. So actually they'll have a low pressure turbine attached, sorry, low pressure turbine in the back attached to a low pressure compressor. And in the middle, they'll have a separate spool that can go at a separate RPM. That'll be a high pressure turbine attached to a high pressure compressor. And some might even have a third a third spool. And so that way you can, at different pressure gains, you can match your speed. And so lots of, uh, you know, lots of neat ways that this can get more complicated uh, for, for sure. And, you know, really, I, I remember my time as a professor um, and I, I did a lot of jet engine research. I was actually, you know, studying the first stage turbine with some high-end supercomputings and just all the fluid flow going around it. But I remember being at a conference and the head of Rolls-Royce uh, R&D, I, I think framed it so well for me. And, Apologize if the numbers are off, and this was you know, back in 2008 time frame, but I remember them saying that, hey, like, if you think of a 0.1% increase in efficiency, that's worth a billion dollars of R&D because of how that impact then drives you know, all the turbines between, from aviation to power generation to all that stuff. So, you know, sneaking out a 0.1% jump was, was really huge. Okay, so I want to talk now, though, about the, the thrust. So really, and again, I'll kind of remind you that the way that a turbine is making thrust in the end, it's that thrust T is effectively the mass flow rate coming through the engine times whatever the exit velocity is minus the inlet velocity. Now, this is cheating a little bit. The mass flow rate is not quite constant. I'm adding fuel, but usually it's it's um, a small. It's like 15 to 1, right, the, in terms of the mass of the fuel compared to the mass of the air. So it's, this is close enough for our purposes just to understand the, the barrage strokes of what's happening, right? And so over here, again, this is V, that's Vn. Oh, off screen, huh? Vn. Good. And then over here is V out. Right. Good. 
we exit. Okay, so, so that's the thrust. And then, you know, a couple of things I want you to see. There's a VN, this is the speed of my aircraft, right? So first one is, why, why is this thrust falling down? Well, let me just divide that and show you that, because what's happening, uh, maybe you can think VE exit is the same, but v, if V inlet is getting faster and faster, the thrust is going to die off. Or, or just the other way to look at it is you can say thrust divided by the inlet speed, just to have an idea. It's going to look like the mass flow rate of air, and then it's really kind of this. So you can kind of see that maybe most of this is going to stay constant, and this is going to drive a little bit of a kind of a 1 over V fall off. We, we would expect that. So in fact, if you've ever seen sort of this famous diagram of specific impulse versus speed, you see these this curves, like there's a reason this curve is pretty much a, a 1 over V curve. Oh, that didn't show up very well. Let's see if I can do this. This is a 1 over V curve. Eh, close enough. So there's a reason behind that. It, it's kind of this framework here. So, you know, as we, as we then explore this a little bit more, and, and a specific impulse, this is just saying, hey, I have this thrust. In fact, I want to... I want to say this thrust is all coming from I'm burning fuel. So it's, it's the mass flow rate of the fuel times the specific impulse. So specific impulse is just a measure of how much thrust am I getting for my mass flow rate of, of fuel. And using units wise, it's usually in seconds. We usually divide by uh, a, met a gravitational constant to get rid of it. Um, that's where the English units are awesome. It's pound force versus pound mass per second. You get seconds, but it's, it's usually, you know, higher is better is the answer. And so you have... Yeah, at low speeds, your highest is a turbo fan. That would be a turbine driving a big fan right in front. And then you have turbo fan with afterburners, or maybe we're getting a little bit extra combustion in the back. And then you go to the ramjet, like we were talking about below, and, then, and kind of the last episode. And then ultimately over the scramjet, again, uh, people have made a few scramjets. Uh, it, very challenging, and for the most part today, I'm not going not gonna to get into it. So uh, the other piece I want to kind of finish with, as we're talking about jet engines and wrapping this section up, is taking a look at the thrust per cross-sectional area. This is important, right? Because, you know, the, the turbine itself is going to have drag. It's, it's kind of staring into the wind. And so you also have to understand, you know, how much of this drag is being affected because of my, my turbine. So thrust to, to unit area is usually a good way of imagining that, right? If I'm going to stick something in the wind or it, it better, yes, it better be thrusting, but just to kind of characterize that. And so in the end, this mass flow rate, if you've, you know, taking fluid mechanics before, this is density times the velocity and the area being captured. So if I'm doing thrust divided by area, that then is just rho v, and I'm going to, I'm just going to call this term here, I'm just going to call it delta v, just to kind of say, so rho v times delta v. Okay, well, mentioned last time, we're usually flying at a constant dynamic pressure. That might be aerodynamically optimal for our wings and the drag and all the system. So Instead of just saying rho v, I'm actually going to say, you know, I'll add a factor of two just to be consistent. This is two times that dynamic pressure divided by velocity times, again, delta v. So this is the thrust per cross-sectional area. And so, again, from this point of view, you can see why that would drive. So if I'm flying at a constant dynamic pressure, right, if I'm flying at a constant dynamic pressure, then what's happening as I go to higher speeds is that same thrust, because I'm not changing the cross-section of my, my inlet, that same, th same thrust is going to go down because of that speed that I'm going. So this is a very natural thing that we would expect. We would expect the thrust to fall off in an air-breathing jet engine system as you go, as you go faster. And the same is going to be true of, of the ramjet, same is going to be true of the scramjet. That's kind of why, again, it's really not surprising that this entire curve has this 1 over V characteristic. Right? And so that's, that's really jet engines at the highest level. And you know, I may do another episode to kind of dig in a little bit more deeper, but when you want to think of turbine-based combined cycle, right, so this is driving towards turbine-based combined cycle, and what, of it, what are its main challenges? And I'll come back and I'll talk about turbine-based combined cycle versus rocket-based combined cycle, but just, just to kind of highlight, again, the challenges behind turbine-based combined cycle. One, you have, you have the pinch, right, where you have, you got to make sure you have enough thrust and you're going to go slowly through kind of this, this supersonic area, and vehicle shape has a lot to do with that. You have then this gap. You have the situation where you know your thrust may fail off before your ramjet starts. So how do you extend that gap? You have challenges with heating, and so I mentioned here again the skin temperature. But when you are compressing, each stage of these this compression is actually getting hotter and hotter. And so the 
you know, so we mentioned the gap, gap in the pinch, right? But then you have heat on the on the uh, inside the engine, so heat on the compressor. Because every time you're heating this up, you're, every time you're pressing it, you're actually heating it up. And so the SR71, in order to go Mach 3, that SR71 actually had this really awesome system where it then took like half of its compressor blades and then and didn't do it. So at Mach 3.2, even before then, it was only using a couple compression and then it was then going all the way around it into uh, what amounts to be its, its afterburner, which is kind of a ram burner shoved up next to it. So that's that's the next challenge from a turbine-based combined cycle point of view is, is kind of surviving the, the heat. And so whether you're trying to you know, cool the air or a couple different techniques people have looked at before. And then in the end, all, all ramjets right, will ultimately suffer from an unstart. And we'll get into this a little bit when we talk more about ramjets. Uh, and so then you have to... Um, at high speeds, there's heat of your compressor, but you have to fully cocoon the turbine. You have to fully isolate it because at some point in Mach 4, Mach 5, this is way too hot for all, not, not even just the last couple rows of the compressor blades, but all of the compression. So all of these things cannot sit in the wind. Even if you just got a ramjet going on, you, you can't like turn off the blades. They'll just melt. And so you have to cocoon them, which then means if I've got it cocooned and I have my, my inlet here unstart on me, then I have to have some way of recovering it. So th this is kind of the major, you know, kind of the big three behind turbine-based combined cycle. Um, and again, you know, compression speed is is interesting. It might have, you know, help you solve this gap, but it's it's not necessarily uh, the one thing alone that drives all of this problem. So th these are really the biggest problems here, uh, namely, how do you solve the gap and the pinch? What do you do with that compression? How do you get past that gap if you're trying to drive your turbine? It's the heat. And ultimately, like I said before, the definition of hypersonic is, is how do you handle the heat? So you have to cocoon your turbine, and then what's your plan if, you're, if your ramjet unstarts and you have to turn your turbine back on? So those are the challenges. Uh, next episode, we'll get into kind of rocketry, and then I'll get into rocket-based combined cycle, and then we'll kind of come back and compare you know, these two methods, and then you know, why, in our opinion, we're, we're seeing the rocket-based combined cycle as, as superior to the turbine-based combined cycle. Thank you.